Hey. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Philip. Um, I've been on these calls before, but if you don't know me, I am the uh, CTO of Plon, and I designed the basic architecture for uh, for naive rollups, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, so as as we approach the release of naive rollups, we we want to explain the system uh, and spread understanding as far as we can uh, for three reasons. First, we want to describe the system now before it's launched so that we can receive feedback and make changes in response to that. Second, uh, we want as many users as possible to, um, to understand the system so that when we launch, uh, there can be minimal confusion. And third, we want to clearly explain to Galaxy holders what exactly they're voting on. Um, a brief aside about that, because not everyone's aware about how governance uh, of Urban ID works. Um, and I'd love to go into a lot more detail here about the other options we could have chosen, but um, Urban ID right now is governed by a galactic Senate um, consisting of all Galaxy holders. Uh, basically, we think this is a good group of people to decide questions about the technical direction of, of Urban ID to make sure that it's uh, that it reacts to our to our needs. Um, and um, having a group like this allows us to react more quickly and decisively to the change needs of the network than if we had to convince everyone of every change. Um, of course, if we abuse this power, um, I say we because I hold the galaxy, um, then you are all, uh, obviously you can just ignore us and uh, change whatever you want on your machine. Um, the only cost is that you'd be incompatible with our version of Urban. Anyways, um, there's been a few small upgrades that that have happened to the Urban ID contracts. Um, this is definitely the, the, the biggest one that's been proposed. Um, and uh, so we want to try and make sure everyone understands clearly what's happening. Um, right, so um, let's talk about naive rollups. So gas prices are expensive. Planet transfers now cost, if you're lucky, $50. Um, it, it could be potentially significantly more than that. Um, so we evaluated a bunch of solutions and decided on naive rollups uh, because number one, they have nearly the same security and decentralization properties as Ethereum. Number two, they, uh, they don't require us to wait for some other project to be finished and hope that it stays maintained and funded and so on. We can build it and maintain it ourselves. And then number three, it allows us to be masters of our own destiny in the sense that we're not subject to some untested governance system, some governance token, of one of these layer two projects um, and that, you know, frankly, you shouldn't have a lot of faith in until it's proved itself. So this seems like the, the best option for a project like this that has the least sort of external dependencies. Um, so right now, if you want to talk to Ethereum, like it, it, so if you want to interact with Urban ID, you send a transaction to Ethereum, which ingests it, executes it, and saves the result. Um, with naive rollups, we give the option that if you want to switch to layer two, then after that, you send your transactions to Ethereum, um, which ingests it, but does not execute it and does not save the result. And so this saves 98 to 99% of the gas costs. Um, so if it was going to cost $50, now it should cost less than a dollar. Um, to get the best co gas cost, you have to submit your transaction to an aggregator known as a roller. Um, these don't have any control over your ID. You don't have to trust them in particular. Um, they simply batch transactions and send them all in one big batch. Um, anyone can run a roller. You can run one yourself. Um, but since each batch has a fixed cost, not a real big fix, fixed cost, but a fixed cost. Um, it's cheaper per transaction if you send them in large batches. Um, so the roller pays the gas costs to Ethereum. And so uh, a simple roller, like the like economically simplest roller, would just require you to pay for each transaction by sending them either a Bitcoin or a credit card or something. Um, but it's also this arrangement makes it easy for a service provider to cover your transactions 
um, possibly up to like a quota. So for example, if you pay 15, 20 bucks a month to host your planet, um, then that, that provider might let you send, you know, three transactions per month for free or one per week, or they might say, uh, every transaction you send, we're just going to add a dollar to your bill, but we already have your, you know, all your information. And so, uh, it, you know, should be pretty, uh, frictionless. Um, initially Klon intends to run a roller for the public without charging gas fees. Um, but with only a, a fairly small number of transactions per ship. Um, this should make it easy to get on Urbit with with real keys where you actually own your ship, but without having to touch either at all. Um, at least until, I mean, yeah. Um, so the user experience should feel a lot like it does now, except that you don't have to pay uh, exorbitant gas costs. Um, but you're going to use Bridge like normal with your existing keys. You can use your Urban HD wallet, you know, your paper wallet. You can use um, MetaMask. You can use Ledger, uh, Trezor. You should use basically any any uh, Ethereum wallet that we support so far. Um, and yeah, uh, if if you don't take any action at all, actually, your ships are going to remain on layer one for now. Um, governed by the existing Ethereum contracts. And then when you want to start using layer two because you want to start sending transactions, um, you can deposit your ship to layer two, uh, which unlocks the ability to send cheap transactions. The, um, when I say layer two, now you roll ups, those are, I mean the same thing by those. Um, star owners in particular should consider this so that they can uh, spawn planets cheaply. Uh, depositing a ship to layer two is irreversible. That's a very important point. So if you send your ship to layer two, then you can't use that ship on layer one infrastructure, like multi-sig contracts or decentralized exchanges. If your goal is to use Urbit, this is generally not, generally not a problem. And you can, of course, still transfer your ships. Um, it's just that you, uh, you can't do it using smart contracts. Um, a star can also deposit only its spawn proxy. It, 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 I mean, you can deposit the whole star or you can choose to deposit only the spawn proxy, um, which is also irreversible, uh, but it makes the star able to cheaply spawn planets on layer two while keeping the ownership management keys on layer one. That might be useful for some people. I anticipate that most stars that want to spawn planets will just deposit the whole star, um, but there may be cases where it makes sense to, uh, to keep the star on layer one. Um, and of course, you can later deposit the rest of the star to layer to layer two. Anyways, uh, enough talk about that. Uh, this is all going to be clear if we see a demo. So, um, let, so we're going to hear from some of the team working on this project, um, and we'll start with Jimmy, who's the the designer working on this project, um, who designed the new bridge interface, um, which he is going to demo now. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, I'm Jimmy or Fallen Office. Um, I designed most of Bridge and I'm on the L2 team. And with like a lot of the azimuth upgrades uh, with layer two rollups, we've also made some improvements with Bridge. And so now I'm gonna show you like a quick demo of uh, what we've done um, to make this uh, experience better. Um, so I think a lot of you are probably like um, have layer one stars right now, right? So uh, one of the things that we'll start to cover is just like, how do you get from layer one to layer two? Um, so in this new bridge, we have this drop down here. Um, and this holds kind of, you can see a list of everything that you own and also just like what state they're in. So I can scroll all the way down here if I wanted to migrate. And if I click on that, it will remind me that the, tra the transaction I'm about to perform is irreversible. So I'm just gonna press migrate. And on this screen, I'm going to learn a little bit about migration, about how much it might be really expensive. This is in flux. Um, but the biggest thing is probably like that your charger transactions will be pushed at the end of the day or at a certain time, maybe like an hour or so. But you'll be able to see a timer um, when the next batch will be. Um, and if I wanted to learn more, I can click here. But I'm going to proceed to this migration. And as Phil mentioned, you can either transfer your whole star, or if you want to transfer your uh, spawn proxy only, 
Um, of course, both actions are irreversible. So I'm just going to transfer the point and then send the transaction. And because this is like a layer one transaction, it's a pretty big transaction. This will probably take a while. So for the purpose of this demo, we've skipped ahead and um, um, went to this star, which is uh, one that's already on L2. So as you can see here, the interface is a little bit different. Maybe in the top right, you'll see like this timer countdown. And this countdown is telling you basically of when your next, um, uh, the next batch will be sent out. So you want to get your transactions in before the countdown is done. Of course, this is just like reoccurring. Um, and I also see on the, to the left of it, there's like this uh, envelope icon with like five next to it. And if I click on that, I'll see that I have five planet codes in here. And these planet codes, now that you can copy these URLs and just send them to your friends, and this makes it very easy for you to kind of just um, use whatever platform you want to use, iMessage or Signal or whatever, to send these planets, and they can kind of do that like without any help from you. Um, you can also download these as CSV files. I know some of you maybe um, run your own databases if you're kind of running like um, a marketplace for selling your planets. So you can now download that as a CSV file, and um, you can manage it in your, with your own database that way. So uh, I'm just going to copy this and send it to this, um, one of my friends and just like activate it. So then they would just paste it in, um, in their URL. And then as soon as they paste it, they'll see that hey, welcome, and uh, this is the planet name, and then I want to claim it. So once I do that, that'll start generating, um, and this is kind of generating the whole entire wallet, and once that's done, you'll see that um, something about a master key, and probably most of you know that the master key is like a forward um, kind of passphrase um, to for your planet, uh, but now, uh, we do it in a way where we can reveal this um, so that you can kind of see your master tick here and we're letting you back up however way you want to. So you can obviously copy this and put it in your password manager um, and or you could just write it down. Um, and of course, to proceed, I'm going to have to download a backup of this. Um, and this is like your passport. Um, so this is going to download into here into like my computer. And I'm gonna have to do this off screen that you won't see, but see here. There we go. And uh, okay, and then I'm gonna enter this from my Passport. And then that should work. And then now that's complete. And now I own this planet and all without having to go to bridge. And now I can either proceed down on the client for Mac, um, which is what we call port, or you can set this up via command line. And you can use this planet now um, without having to set your networking keys. That's all been done. Um, and yeah, that's it. It's really plain and simple. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Jose to kind of talk about the architecture of how this is all run. Thank you, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Hi, yes. everyone. My name is Jose or Norsi Torin. And yes, Jimmy was saying I'm going to be talking about the, the layer two roller which is a um, what we have uh, what we have developed together with the with the layer two team that's uh, actually allowing for these transactions that uh, uh, the bridge interacts with to uh, to go to the blockchain so to begin with to give a bit of context how the roller fits in the uh, with the previous version of bridge um, so this is basically the the architecture of uh, every interaction that Bridge is doing or every transaction that has been sent. This is basically an HTTP request to an inferior node. And basically, an inferior node is just a service that offers an API for uh, um, dealing or receiving um, uh, for receiving Ethereum transactions. Um, 
So every time that when you're on bridge, you are you want to spawn a planet, change your keys, uh, set your spawn proxy, and so on. Bridge under the hood is just constructing an HTTP request, sending that to the Infura node that's connected to an Ethereum node to actually submit that to the blockchain and include that in the next block. So the roller is something else that we have added to Bridge. So uh, as Philip was saying, if you want to remain on, on layer one, you can do that, and then Bridge is going to interact with the Infura node. But for every interaction with the layer two, the bridge or any uh, third party client is going to interact with the roller. Uh, it exposes a similar API. We've uh, used the OpenRPC specification um, to receive all of those HTTP requests. Uh, it's going to receive those transactions. And under the hood, uh, the roller is connecting to also an inferior node that um, will also send those transactions to the blockchain. Uh, could also be any other uh, node that uh, or any other service that um, offers access to the uh, to the Ethereum blockchain. So, getting a bit more detail into what's uh, exactly the roller, uh, we could, um, uh, as we can see here, basically the the roller is a set of goal agents. Uh, that's already telling us uh, how to run a roller because in order to run a roller, you need to uh, you need to run an, an Um It's worth uh, mentioning that this doesn't need to be, or you need to have an Urbit ID for that. This is what we call a fake shot. So um, any, uh, or I mean, there is no um, interaction at this point with the rest of the uh, of the uh, Urbit network. Uh, it's something that we are looking on to include in the future, but as of this point, the, or you can see here, uh, the interaction is just HTTP request come via the API, and then we are directly talking with that with an with an Ethereum node via the Infura service. So, uh, yeah. So those uh, these are the three main agents. Of course, we are also also using threads for the interaction with the nodes and so on. But these are the three main agents that the roller needs to run. The first one is the roller RPC. This is the the interface with Bridge or any third party client. Uh, the um, what the roller RPC agent does is um, exposes an endpoint that any client is going to interact with. Uh, also exposes the RPC API with all the commands that are supported by the roller. Uh, also, it does validation of the input, so we're sure that you are sending the, the the right data, and also sends back any response to the clients. Uh, then we have the roller agent, and as you can imagine by its name, it's the most important one, and I will go into detail later on. But very briefly now, it's just receiving layer two transactions. It's uh, applying them to the to the azimuth state to confirm that they are valid, uh, and then we'll send them as a batch to the uh, Ethereum node. And then the third agent is the azimuth agent. Um, so as I was saying with the roller, the roller is sending transactions to the Ethereum node. The azimuth agent is is listening for updates from the Ethereum node. So the estimate agent is uh, subscribed to both layer one and layer two contracts. And then when there is new transactions that are confirmed on the on the blockchain, it will just hear about them, compute the new estimate state. So the estimate agent has the, you can say that is the source of truth for all the all the estimate data. OK, now I'm going to go into detail about what uh, uh, the roller does when transactions come in you uh, verify that they are valid, and then you are sending them as a batch. Uh, and just, just briefly now, you are wondering what's required to run a roller. Um, of course, you need to have those agents installed. But once you are, uh, when once you have started them, there are two things that you need to have access to. Uh, so the first one is, as I was saying, an, an Ethereum node. It could be a local node that you have access to, or it could be an inferior node. Uh, but you need to have access to this. And then, because you are um, sending transactions that you need to sign, you need to load a private key in, into the roller. Uh, and of course, the um, the address that's associated with um, with this private key needs to have enough ether to pay for the transaction that transaction that you're gonna send. Uh, but that's pretty much it. Now that once you have that ready, you are you can you know um, advertise the URL that the RPC that the roller RPC agent exposes, and then anybody could submit transactions to you. So uh, this is the flow of receiving any transaction. So as I was saying, or 
the example that Jimmy showed, uh, Bridge would be sending those transactions uh, using the HTTP RPC API. But if you are a roller operator, you could locally uh, poke the roller agent with, you can construct the transaction manually. And we are we are currently working on, a, um, it's a work in progress command line application that makes this a bit more, um, a, a bit easier. And I will be demoing later on in the presentation. But the flow goes like this. So all of these transactions are added to a list that we call the list of pending transactions. And uh, when you initialize the, the roller, we set up a, a timer. In this case, it's one hour. So every hour, we are going to check what's in the list of pending transactions. And then we are going to get the um, uh, get the layers two state from the asymmetric agent. This is the kind of, uh, we could call it the, the canonical state. And then we will apply the rollup function or the or the naive function to those transactions and the state together. Uh, and this is a step where we are using this as, as a kind of Hoon smart contract. Um, if when we are applying this function, there are some transactions that are not are not valid, we will discard them. But the ones that are are valid will be moved into uh, the next state, which is what we call the descending state. And these are basically then uh, transactions that are going to be sent to the Ethereum node, but we haven't, um, we are not, we we don't know if they have been confirmed already on on the blockchain. And this is important. We are as associating to this kind of frozen list of transactions a nonce, and this is the uh, the next nonce associated with the address that's signing the batches to the um, when uh, they are sent to the to to the blockchain. Uh, and then um, a nonce is just a number. Um, that indicates how many transactions have been submitted by by this address, uh, and this part is important because this is used later on when we need to confirm that the that the batch has been has been sent. And then now we have we have descending uh, this list of sending transactions. Now it's time to make a batch, which is the layer two role, sign them and send them to the uh, to the Ethereum node. And the process of making them into a a role is is very simple. We are going through the list of sending transactions, and we're just getting the raw bytes for each of them, and then just putting them one after the other. So we have a pretty, pretty much a, um, a very long byte string. And then this byte string is going to be signed and then sent to, uh, to a specific contract that, that you can see here. Uh, this, co this contract is not a smart contract in any sense. It's a, it's a very, very simple contract. I think it's five or six lines. Uh, the only thing that it does is just receives the raw data, and then later on it's going to send that as an as, as an event that anybody that subscribes to that can can hear about it. Uh, but that's pretty much it in terms of how we send we send those layer two batches. Uh, and here we are using a, a thread that has some facilities for checking that you have enough ether to pay for the transaction, that the node is up, and if it's not, it's gonna do some retry. Uh, it's gonna try to retry. Um, but that's uh, pretty much it for sending that. So now the next step is that how do we uh, confirm that this is um, actually a, a part of a block. So something uh, worth mentioning here is that we haven't really done any complex logic of kind of directly talking with the Ethereum node where we need to manually check, is this transaction still pending? Is it in the mempool? Did it fail or so on? We are not dealing with the, um, because it could, uh, it could be very complex. So the way that we are doing it is that every time that we send a batch uh, that and then we know that the Ethereum node has received that batch and it's gonna add it into their pending list or whatever it's doing, we are gonna set up a, a um, five minute timer. And then we will associate the nonce that we send to that timer. So when the timer comes back, we will look at the nonce and ask what's, uh, I mean, how many transactions are in the sending list associated with these nonce? If there are any transactions there, we'll just go through the same process again. We'll just create the batch, we'll send the layer two role, we will sign it, and then we will send it. But this time, we're going to increase the gas price. Uh, so with this kind of slightly higher price, um, we are we are uh, we are taking care of the situation where uh, maybe gas price is very high now, so we are not getting com confirmed because of that. So it's going to try this logic, this retry logic, will be try every five minutes until there are no more sending transactions. So now that we have the logic for that, uh, the question is how do we get the confirmations? 
So as I mentioned before, the, the Asimov agent is very important in this step because uh, the Asimov agent is going to receive updates, uh, confirmations for both layer one and layer two contracts. So every time a layer two batch is confirmed on the blockchain, the Asimov agent will hear about it and then will apply the rollup function uh, from the state that it has now to all the transactions in the batch, creating a new, um, a new layer two state. And then also, <clears throat> for every uh, subscriber of the Asimov agent, it will send uh, updates for each of the transactions in the batch. And in this case, the roller subscribes to the Asimov agent. So when a new transaction comes in, com comes in uh, sent by the Asimov agent, we will check, is this transaction in our sending list? And if it is, we will remove it. And then we will keep doing that until there are no more transactions. And this is the point where at some point the five minute timer will come back, check that this is empty, it won't set the thread again, and then the nonce, we can say that it's done. And that's pretty much it for the, in a very high level, uh, what's going on with the roller in terms of receiving and sending transactions. If you want to actually look at the code, we are uh, working, uh, we have a working uh, branch here in the um, Urbit repo. Uh, so feel free to take a look at it. Uh, and you have any comments, uh, you can always ask. Uh, one last thing I could like to add is that, um, as I mentioned, Bridge or any third-party client can interact with the with the roller. Uh, so what we've done is that we've made a a um, library using the OpenRPC specification. So we can define our API in a JSON document. So basically, we are just defining uh, inputs and outputs for each of the methods. But once we have that defined we can automatically generate documentation for that API for all the methods. And you can see here, uh, these are basically all the RPCs that the roller, um, that the roller API supports. Uh, so there are things like uh, spawning points, transferring them, changing keys, but also things that are more specific to the roller, like retrieving the pending transactions, uh, getting the transaction history and so on. As Together with the documentation, we can generate a client. In this case, it's a TypeScript client. Uh, so we can see that it gives us some very nice functions for uh, not manually construct the HTTP request. So we can just call the call the call the methods with the with the required data. And because it's TypeScript, we also get nice types for responses and for basically all all the data that's that's used by the client. And now I have a small demo that I will show the command line application that I mentioned before. Uh, and it's also going to show uh, basically this uh, TypeScript library sending transactions to it. And then you will see updates in the roller as well. So let's check that everything's working. And I'll break now. All right, so we have everything here ready for our demo. Um, here in the upper right corner, we have a local Ethereum node. That's the one that we are gonna, or that's the one that the roller is gonna uh, send layer two transactions and receive updates when they are confirmed on the blockchain. And then down here, we are going to run small script with some example transactions. Uh, so these are some of the layer two transactions that we can send to the roller, like spawning a planet, changing their keys and so on. This uh, the script here has been developed using the TypeScript library that I mentioned earlier. So now the first step is going to be to run to put our roller, which is installed in our fake cell. And now the first step is going to be to start the roller agent. We will also see that we have received the asymmetric state from the uh, asymmetric agent. So we have now a view of the canonical uh, state for all the points that uh, exist in the, uh, in the asymmetric state. Now we need to connect with the Ethereum node using this generator that has already saved the address of the local Ethereum node. And now that we have that, we can load the private key. And at the same time, we will receive the latest nonce. Here, you can see we have received the get transaction count in the node, and the nonce has been received as well in the roller. So now we have everything ready. We're going to go to the command line application that we have. Uh, this is very simple, but because we need to send transactions, it's always good to get a view of the history. And the, the transaction history is 
for a given Ethereum address. So we're gonna only here list the transactions that are, that have been uh, sent by this address. And because we haven't really done anything yet, this is empty. But the way it works is that we are going to subscribe for updates for this address. Uh, now we are already subscribed and, and the first thing that we receive from the roller is the list of points that the address controls. Uh, and these are uh, ships that we can perform actions on. So you can see here that we are seeing the ones that we are controlling. So that's everything that we need. Now we're going to go to the script here and then run all of these transactions. Uh, and then on the left here on the roller, we're going to see updates when the transactions come in. So let's go ahead and run this thing. Um, there should already start coming in. There you go. We have already three, four, five pending transactions here. And then we can see here that we run all of them. Uh, there are more transactions that we've sent that updates because some of them have been signed by other addresses. So we're only, we, we only care about updates for the specific address here. So now normally we will have to wait one hour, but we don't want to do that. And we're going to go ahead and manually submit the transactions to the node. And this is going to take everything in pending, apply the layer two state with the rollup function, see if everything doesn't validate. And what does validate is going to be sent to the firm. And we will also get updates for that. There you go. We have some point updates. These are the new points that have been spawned. And then these transactions now actually are in the sending state. And we can confirm that looking at the history. That's it. So now we are already, you can see here, send broad transaction. And then uh, when the roller asks the Ethereum node, uh, give me the latest one, we're going to see the new updates coming in. So now we are seeing that the HTTP server is uh, getting the updates. And there you go. We have received updates for the five transactions. All of them have been confirmed. And we also get the notification that we are done with the nonce. So the retry logic won't be started again. And just to confirm with the commanding application that we also have that there, there we go. Uh, we have all the five transactions already confirmed. Uh, so that's everything for the demo. So that was it. Uh, thank you so much. And I guess we are ready to bring the rest of the team. Alrighty, yeah. So um, as I mentioned in the uh, in the comments, we're now going to do a, a Q and A. Um, we're actually going to bring out the entire team that has been working on on layer two. Um, uh, and we're also all going to be available at least for a bit afterwards uh, in our whatever happy hour thing after uh, afterwards. There'll be a Google Meet link, and you can you can join it. Um, uh, so I'll briefly introduce the team. Uh, Alvin Foslop is uh, Mark, and he is uh, he helped with with the changes to the Layer One contracts. Also integrated Layer Two with uh, the runtime in a couple of ways and uh, did a bunch of other miscellaneous work. Um, Fab Nev Hinmer Will is um, uh, working on the on the front end, working on bridge. Um, Jimmy, we've met. Jose, of course, we met. And um, Pop Rocks um, is um, uh, so he he wrote extensive tests for Naive Dot and it's probably the best tested code in bit now, um, which is really good because it's important. Um, and also wrote uh, most of the documentation for layer two. And then uh, Dr. Sonnet, um, Tom is uh, is working on, on bridge as well. Um, and so now I'll go through the questions that I saw already. You can keep adding questions and I'll try and find them at the end. There's like eight or nine questions already. So, um, the first question I saw is, will the roller UI live in Urbit as a tile? Um, Jose, you want to take that? Well, that's something that I've been uh, thinking. Yeah, because um, the uh, the roller UI that you've seen is the command line interface, which is nice, but 
you know, uh, it's also a very good thing to visually see all the list of transactions that uh, that you are submitting. So, yeah, definitely, mm, that's something that we are considering doing, uh, and definitely should be there uh, as well. The roller is running on your orbit, uh, and something some, something also worth mentioning is that uh, at this point, the orbit. An orbit ID is not needed to run the roller, but uh, you can imagine, as, as Philip was saying before, uh, that uh, hosting hosting providers could um, be rollers as as well. So their their planets could send transactions up up to them. At this point, this is not done yet, but it's something that we are all also considering. Yeah. Cool. Uh, next question is, uh, I assume rollers might want to coordinate on timing, like we'll take the 5 a.m. batch or something like that. Um, but I can answer this. Uh, I think, yeah, we'll we'll see how this ends up working out. I wouldn't be surprised if you end up with rollers basically, you know, if, if you have, say, several hosting providers um, and they're not, like, filling up whole batches, uh, it could be reasonable to make, like, a mutual agreement where it's like, well, we'll just do a round robin, each person does a batch and we'll just send the transactions from one to the next um, so that we can do larger batches and make it cheaper. Um, I think that that kind of thing will uh, will emerge just because it's more efficient um, whenever the uh, whenever the gas prices basically make it worth, uh, you know, thinking about it and, and designing that. My guess is that at current gas prices, it's probably not gonna end up being, being necessary, but uh, gas prices could easily go up you know, five X and then maybe you're thinking, then maybe it is reasonable. Um, yeah, I, I think there, there, there's a lot of, of ways that this could end up uh, looking like. Um, next question says, uh, maybe this has already been answered, but what's the rationale behind the move to layer two being irreversible? Um, I will also answer this one. Um, Uh, although uh, Kenny's comments were also useful in this, it basically, or Edward, I forget who, um, it is in theory possible to make a layer two that uh, that can withdraw back to layer one. Um, I think that that, like, so uh, ZK rollups and optimistic rollups are both trying to do that. Uh, they're both very hard problems and they're right in the early stages of being solved. Some of them have, have just gone on mainnet recently, um, which is great. And I encourage all of that, definitely. Um, but it's not, in my opinion, they're not ready for prime time. Um, and so the, uh, the way that you can do a layer two without solving any really hard problems is by making it so that you can only deposit to layer two. I hope that at some point we are able to withdraw from layer two as well. There's a few ways that could happen. We could write up a uh, like zero knowledge proof system for naive rollups as they are. Um, another uh, way that that could happen though, and I'll refer back to this later as well, is that basically Um, the galaxies could choose to vote in a uh, like a hash of all these ships that uh, that said they want to go back to layer one. It's a very high friction type thing to do, um, and we don't have any immediate plans for that. And I wouldn't count on it, right? I wouldn't count on being able to reverse going to layer two. But there are various ways that we could. And so if it if it turns out that basically it's it's clear that the network should either go back to layer one or more likely switch them to another layer two solution or something like that. There are ways that that can be done. They're fairly high friction, but that's part of the role of, of, of the galaxies is to recognize something like that um, and, uh, and react to it. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, the second half of this question, was also answered decently in the comments, but uh, can, can anyone with access to address uh, 0x222, et cetera, uh, take control of the ships deposited? And the answer is basically yes, but nobody should have access to that um, because it's a made up address. 
And if you could find the keys for a made up address, you could find the keys for any address. Um, and so the, the, the point of choosing an obviously made up address is to prove that nobody has the keys for it because it would be, it would take forever to mine the keys for such a, uh, no, like a distinct address. All right. Um, along some of the same lines, uh, the next question is, would uh, ETH2, Ethereum 2.0, resolve this issue with proof of stake, increasing transaction speed without the need for an, irre an irreversible layer two? So the, the irreversible part I just talked about, um, basically, if it turns out, for example, that Ethereum 2.0 just makes everything cheap uh, and we want to move everything back to it, then that's in the interest of kind of everyone on the network. And so we can coordinate that as a, you know, as a one-off thing. Um, the, uh, however, I don't anticipate that Ethereum 2.0 is actually going to have that effect. Um, first of all, to move everything back to Ethereum 2.0 or to Ethereum in a 2.0 world, you need, um, not only data shards, but shards with computation, I think they're called execution shards, something like that. Um, and those have been deprioritized and are definitely several years out. Um, and there's been a lot of talk in the last year or two about just not doing those at all and just doing data sharding, which would increase, uh, which uh, data shards don't help for layer one contracts, but they do make your rollups cheaper because we're just putting data on the blockchain. And so that should, in theory, make uh, using rollups 64 times cheaper or 50 times cheaper or something like that, depending on how many shards and how efficient that all ends up. Um, but also, even that is potentially some time away. And Ethereum 2.0's uh, deadline keeps slipping. And I, I, I still have a decent amount of confidence in the team. It's just I don't have any confidence in any particular deadline. And so... Um, yeah, I wish them the best, but we can't be waiting for them. All right. Um, next question is, will Tlon's hosted bridge uh, be able to use other rollers besides Tlon? Or if I run my own roller, do I need to host my own uh, bridge instance too? Um, how about uh, Tom, you want to answer that? Yeah, good question. Um, uh, one way to approach this would be to uh, run the bridge in local mode, and you can just tweak which uh, URI and port it's pointing to. So yes, you could be able to do this. Great. Do you, do you know, are, are we going to be able to do that with the Ethereum node itself as well that we talked to? Yeah, like when, in, uh, when you're developing it locally, you're running a, a local Ganache Ether node, and you just point to that uh, IP address. So yeah, you can point to your own actual live uh, Ethernet note as well. Nice. All right. Um, next question is, if I want to interact with layer two on Mars, do I poke or watch the uh, uh, roller RPC or roller? Um, Jose, you want to take that? Yeah, so it's, gonna, it's going to be the roller. Uh, in the demo that, that you've seen, uh, the command line application is going gonna, is gonna to poke the roller. The roller RPC is just to uh, receive HTTP requests. So yeah, when you are on Mars, you need to do it the Mars way. Cool. All right, the uh, next question, uh, what level are centuries on? Can an L2 star center an L1 planet? Um, Mark, you want to take that? Yeah, I can take that. So centuries uh, remain on layer one. Um, they, they also don't have any orbit integration uh, right now, so it would be unclear what, um, what like layer two integration for that would look like. You can certainly imagine in the future saying, okay, we're going to actually finally respect the censures that are on chain on layer one, um, and then saying, okay, maybe we'll also um, provide some affordance for either yeah, doing this through orbits layer two, uh, or implementing a similar mechanism on the urban network itself. We haven't we haven't done any work on actually integrating sensors properly, 
Um, that's not on our list right now, but I can imagine the need for that arising as, as the number grows. Yeah, it's worth, uh, it's worth pointing out also that uh, the initial re release of layer two is relatively limited um, and we can upgrade that to include additional functionality. Like for example, we could add a, a censures um, type of functionality. We could also add like, so for example, one of the issues with layer two or one of the reasons why you might want to stay on layer one is if you want your, your ship to be owned by a multi-sig contract. Um, it would be fairly straightforward to write a basic multi-sig contract in Hoon on layer two. Um, and then you'd be able to, uh, you'd be able to do that on layer two as well. So um, th there's a lot of possible upgrades uh, that we could make, you know, whenever we feel like it's, um, uh, it, you know, something worth, uh, worth putting the time and effort into. And then also something that's, um, like has enough kind of benefit to enough people that it's that it's worth including in what should be a, a relatively small specification. Um, next question is: Can we use EIP fifteen fifty nine to send uh, to set gas prices? Um, we don't have a way to do that yet, um, but that should be pretty easy, and it would be a. a the significant win because it makes everything cheaper and it should make our gas price estimation algorithm simpler. Um, and so uh, we will do that hopefully before launch, um, but uh, if not, you know, probably soon, soon after. Um, the last question that I have listed here, uh, or I guess there's, there's one more comments, but so next question then is, um, what is stored in the Ethereum blockchain during a rollup? Um, is it a list of old points addresses and the new points addresses? Um, uh, Pop Rocks, do you want to answer that? Uh, sure. So the uh, data that gets posted on the uh, Ethereum blockchain is basically just a signed list of transactions. Um, so it's, for example, you'll just say, uh, the star uh, Marbud uh, decides to spawn Sample Planet uh, or sa Sample Palnet. Uh, I don't think Sample Palnet is under Marbud, but you get what I mean. And uh, so then that uh, that transaction or that sort of string, which is just translated into like you know a really kind of compressed uh, string of bytes, um, is then signed and posted on the blockchain. And so the um, Ethereum virtual machine in layer one would ordinarily uh, kind of go from there and process what the straight transition is for the uh, PKI. But um, what we've basically done is moved that computation step onto Urbit. So now your ship will see that signed transaction and be able to confirm that the signature is really from Marbud and uh, that they uh, are spawning the planet uh, sample Palnet. And uh, then they, then your ship will then compute the state transition. Um, and uh, this is, um, and so, so basically the, yeah, short version is the uh, Ethereum virtual machine no longer performs the state transition functions. Um, it's just now a list of transactions for layer two is, and then the computation is now done on your ship. Cool, yeah. All right, um, then uh, next question, does upgrading the functionality require Galaxy votes or L1 contract updates? So in general, um, upgrading the functionality of the layer one contracts definitely requires a Galaxy vote. Um, upgrading the functionality of layer two, um, I mean, like, Technically, of course, layer two, each ship is running their own layer two. And so if you wanted to change it for yourself, you could, but then now you're going to disagree potentially about who owns what. Um, and so what you need is to make sure that everyone else agrees with you. And so the way that we 
that we intend to do that is to have the galaxies vote on a hash of the, uh, you know, of the naive Datun, so the, the consensus code. Um, and so we expect, yeah, that, um, uh, that galaxy votes will be required for, for every upgrade of layer two. Um, the galaxy votes themselves have to happen on layer one. Right now, galaxies can't be deposited to layer two because we haven't implemented voting on layer two. Um, that is something we could do at some point, but um, uh, you know, we want the initial launch to be as as minimal as, like basically try to hit that sweet spot of functionality that is used for, like that will save most people the most amount of money without making it a, large complex uh, piece of code that that uh, is likely to have bugs and it will take a long time to get even worked out and we can upgrade in the future. Alrighty, then um, uh, I don't think there were any other questions I missed. Um, so they, uh, we've dropped a link in the, um, uh, in the comments to a Google Meet and um, you're welcome to come hang out, ask more questions, just you know, hang with us. Um, I will real quick answer uh, Edward's last question, which is um, how does Azimuth.hoon handle, handle blockchain reorganizations? Um, we handle it the same way that we've been handling them uh, with the layer one stuff, which I can go into a lot of detail about the, our options there, but essentially we wait for a certain number of confirmations. Um, and then we also have code to, uh, to recognize if there's been a reorganization longer than that. But uh, that's never been hit in, uh, in real life because Ethereum does a pretty decent job of making sure your reorganization is not longer than a couple of blocks at most. Um, and, and Kenny's question real quick. There, so, does this pattern open, open up the possibility of new style of urban smart contracts? Um, potentially, um, the the what we'd be missing for generic urban smart contracts is um, like it would be straightforward to say, okay, send a transaction that includes some knock or the, the hash of some knock, um, and just run that, like incorporate that as something you can later send transactions to. Um, that would be actually pretty straightforward. The uh, The problem there is that it's a denial of service attack because you could include knock that crashes or that spins forever or that uses a bunch of resources. Um, and so what you would need would be a way to sort of meter uh, resource usage the way that gas does for the EVM. Um, the way that we avoid that now is by making sure that each of our transactions that we do support in layer two have a, uh, a fairly small fixed cost um, in terms of our own resources to, uh, to process them. If So in general, in this kind of code, you want to avoid things like loops. You want to avoid anything that can be quadratic in space or time. You want to avoid all of that stuff um, unless you're able to charge people. And so uh, like unless you're able to charge people per resource usage, which is what the EVM does. So maybe someday we'll uh, we'll get to the point where we're able to do that, um, but that's probably a while down the road. Alrighty, then um, I will see you guys in the Google Meet. <laughs>